Have you ever had this experience? Someone in your life, they, uh, they ask you, they say to you, hey, we should grab something to eat. Where would you like to go? Which on the surface sounds like a benign enough question, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds pretty innocent. And yet when you, when you hear this question, panic starts to grip your whole body. Because for the last five times this has been a conversation piece, a, a question, a discussion, it has ended in a really bad fight. And every one of those fights have then turned into three days of bad mojo between the two of you. And, and so you hear this, this simple question, hey, you want to get something to eat, where would you like to go? And um, you decide that today is not the day that you want to get into a fight. And you don't want the days of bad mojo. And so uh, you answer, you simply say, I don't really care. Let's go wherever you would like to go. And then you hear back from the other person. You hear them say, okay, how about we go to Olive Garden? Now, can we just be clear on something? Olive Garden was a great idea back in the 1990s. I mean, standardized, safely Americanized Italian food, what's not to love about that? Especially in the 90s, when the message was, eat all the carbs you want. You know, stay away from fats, don't eat eggs, those are yucky, but eat pasta. And meanwhile, uh, we hadn't heard much of gluten at the time, and so yeah, that sounded like a great idea, and, and we actually thought back in those days that the food pyramid, that was actual science, we thought. And so we're like, yeah, why, why not go to Olive Garden? But can we safely say that we have evolved since the 1990s? And there are way better options, even if you want pasta, than Olive Garden. See, it's, it's, it's now 2019. No one needs to eat at Olive Garden anymore, Jocelyn. <laughs> Maybe I said too much. All right. So, um, so, so you don't want a conflict, you have an opinion, but you just say, you know what, never mind, for the sake of keeping the peace, uh, you say, sounds great, and you go to Olive Garden, and you try your best to be a good sport. You try to enjoy the experience, but you are not happy, and your dinner companion knows that you are not happy. And the question I have for you is, in avoiding the conflict, have you successfully kept the peace? Let's pull the audience. How many of you would say, yes, you've kept the peace? How many of you would say no? A lot of abstainers here. This is like a midterm election, I guess. A lot of people not voting. Uh, live stream, I don't know. yes or no. Yeah, you gotta decide, make it up in your mind. See, when we choose to go along with someone else in order to keep the peace, that's a wise thing to do some of the time. The Bible extors, extols rather, the virtue of peacemaking. I can't tell you the number of times we're, we're called to peace throughout the scriptures. Uh, Steve Hauer, who's been a great mentor to me, um, he taught me this, uh, this kind of, I don't know, it's not a trick, but uh, this kind of thinking. He, he said, you know what, when you're facing a decision and someone else is kind of in a different place, you should ask yourself the question, does this decision matter more to me or does it matter more to you? And if, if it matters more to you than it matters to me, then I'm going to let you decide. And I can't tell you how helpful that's been to me just to, to, to keep me out of conflict numerous of times. And yet there are some of us who have spent a whole lifetime our days are filled with decisions just like the Olive Garden one, choosing peace over conflict, stuffing the things that we want or the things that we need or our desires just for the sake of keeping the water smooth in our life. So do you know someone like that? Uh, for me, when I think about people like that, my mom comes to mind. My mom's a pretty agreeable person, but every uh, Mother's Day, every birthday, when we'd ask my mom, hey, what can we get you? Um, she, she would say the same thing. She would say, I don't want any gifts. I just want peace. I just want you to get along. And we as kids used to roll our eyes thinking that she was just being dramatic or just thinking that she didn't want to give us the money to then buy her a gift. Isn't that such a racket as a parent? You got to give your kids money to buy you a gift. And when they're young, you're like giving your kids money that you don't want to spend in order for them to buy you another stuffed animal. You're like, what 30 or 40 year old dad wants a stuffed animal? But you know, that's kind of how it works. And so we thought my mom was joking, but as I've gotten older, I realized that no, this, this is a woman who really more than anything in her life longs for peace. In conflict, it makes her sick to her stomach. She just, she just can't handle it. I think of my mom, or, or I think of my kids. Uh, I watch them sometimes wrestling with their own needs or wants and, and not being sure if they can ask if that's gonna upset us as parents. And so we have this rule in our house, this policy that we try to follow, and we say, um, here's the rule, here's the policy. You have the right to ask, and I have the right to say no. 
and no one should feel bad about that. You see, because over time, peacemaking, it, it can be a good idea in the near term. It can be a good idea some of the time, just going along with other people for the sake of keeping peace. But it's a terrible idea to try to do it all of the time, even though the Bible calls us to it. Ecclesiastes, for instance, talks about how there's different times or seasons for everything in life. And it says there's a time to love and a time to hate, you know, to be in uh, simpatico or to be in... Um, to be adversarial with people. There's a time for war and a time for peace. It's not about peace all the time. There are different seasons for different things in our life. And, and so here's what happens. For those of us who love peace, who long for peace more than anything else, by pursuing peace above everything else, we end up costing ourselves far more than we could ever realize. And we also cost our relationships far more than we could ever realize, even our relationship with God. So throughout this series, we're talking about different paths that people walk in life, and today we're gonna to talk about people who spend a lot of time on the path of harmony. This is what they might look like, and, and maybe you can identify. If you're walking the path of harmony for any length of time, you can keenly sense and diffuse conflict. Like, you have radar or antenna for conflict in the room. You, you know when there's a disturbance in the force. In the moment it starts to happen, you're aware, you're dialed in, and you know exactly what to do to help alleviate that conflict. Uh, along with that, you are a person who is self-denying, you are unselfish, you are caring. I mean, I mean these are awesome things, right? But, but this is kind of, you just, you just don't think a lot about yourself, you're pretty unselfish, no one would ever call you selfish, you're a caring person. Or, or this, how about this? Uh, you have the superpower of making others feel included. If you spend a lot of time on this path, here's what's true of you. Um, because you kind of can, can sense when there's a disturbance or when there's conflict, you also know when someone's feeling uncomfortable, when someone's feeling excluded or when they're not feeling wanted, and you have the power to know exactly what it is they need to bring them in, to make them feel included, to make them feel a sense of, of belonging. It's really incredible when you watch someone with this gift do that. Or uh, continuing on, you can see both sides of every issue. Sometimes people may accuse you of being a flip-flopper or not having any real conviction, but it's not that. It's just really you can see both sides. You, you can hear someone share their side of a, of a conflict, and, and you can see where they're coming from, and then you can hear the other person, and you can see where they're coming from. And so these people are often really great mediators because they don't just give lip service to understanding or empathy, they really, really feel it. Uh, you're flexible, because for you, you can go with the flow, because more than getting your way, you wanna get along, and you want people to get along, and so you tend to be really, really flexible. Or uh, finally, uh, you love the outdoors in tranquil places. Now, some of you may love the outdoors, but this isn't necessarily you just love the outdoors, but uh, if you walk this path, you just love to be anywhere that's quiet, and peaceful. So for you, solitude isn't probably a, a spiritual practice that you struggle with, and it's probably not the spiritual practice that will lead you to a breakthrough even though you need it in your life. Um, you, you do solitude really, really well. And that may be outside, or that may be putzing around the garage, or, or maybe you really like to sit in a sewing room, or you like to sit and read quietly. When your environment is still, when things are quiet around you, it, it just helps you so much find peace, and, and you love that. Now, now, we may look at this list and we say, wow, this looks great. I mean, everyone should walk this path, right? But like we're going to see throughout this series, on every path that we tend to stick to in life, while there are a lot of good things, sometimes even the good things are driven by not so good things, unhealthy things. And so if we dig a little bit deeper on people who choose to walk the path of harmony, this is what we'll begin to see. That if you're walking this path, that you probably fear strong feelings or desires will end up costing you relationships. Uh, you see life like a tug of war, and, and you're afraid if you pull too hard, the other person at the other end of the rope's gonna let go. And, and you're, you, know, you win, but you lose you lose the relationship. Chances are that when you were younger, you were overpowered or, or maybe not seen or not heard. You felt like your feelings or desires didn't matter or they caused tension. And so uh, for a lot of people who choose the path of harmony, it's not just like, hey, I want people to get along. There is a deep fear that if I, if I have a strong feeling or a desire, that's gonna create tension in a relationship that I need in, a, in the life of someone I love and they're gonna, they're gonna go away. Or uh, when you're walking the path of harmony for too long, you, you notice that you start to, you struggle prioritizing 
or appropriately handling distractions. Truth is, if you walk this path a lot, you kind of love distractions because they keep you from things like priorities. See, here's what happens with a priority. Once you declare a priority, that means that there is now the potential for conflict. If something's really, really important and you declare that to be really, really important, that means that, that you now have to sift through all the other competing interests in your life or in other people's lives. And that's a recipe for conflict. And so when you walk this path for a long time, you may struggle with prioritizing things and, and you'd rather just ride the distractions because those keep you from having to wrestle with the bigger question of, of priorities. Sometimes uh, with this path, uh, it's, it's associated with the sin or the deadly sin of sloth. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're lazy. I mean, that's not kind of an animal I'd like to be compared to, but um, sloth is, is really just, you, you don't want to do the hard work of, of prioritizing. Or when you dig deeper, you see this also, that you aren't angry as a person. No one would ever call you angry, but you're strangely passive-aggressive. See, when you go through life just kind of stuffing the things that you need or want, you can do that for a while, but eventually you start to become resentful. There's something, a, a toll that that takes on your spirit when you feel like no one cares, no one sees, that what you want doesn't matter, and that starts to leak out. And while these people are not angry, I mean, right, they're harmonizers, they're, they're trying to keep their anger at bay, they're kind of like a 1972 Ford Pinto. And they look innocent enough, but if you hit them the wrong way, they're gonna explode. Um, my mom had one of those back in the day, it was fun. Uh, or, or how about this? Uh, when you're digging, uh, when you dig deeper on this, you realize that, that these people who really pursue harmony or peace above everything else, uh, you have a tendency to fall asleep to yourself. Because you over-adjust to what other people in your life want or need, you let their needs or desires trump yours, um, you start to merge with them. And, and you start to just kind of ignore whatever it is inside of you. And then when you start to notice things inside of you, desires or dreams or hopes or purposes that are in conflict with the people in your life that you really want to keep happy, um, that, that brings tension. And so instead of trying to resolve that tension or instead of risking conflict, what you do is you get really skilled at falling asleep to yourself. I'm just not asking those questions anymore. Why bother asking what it, what it is that I want? Where do I want to go to eat? If it's just going to create tension, I'd rather not even look inside of myself to know what's going on inside of me, who I am, what God is calling me to do, what my purpose is, what it is that I really want. You fall asleep to yourself. And if you can't fall asleep to yourself well enough on your own, then uh, you do this thing called numbing or narcotizing where you use food or drink or pills or whatever you can find to put yourself to sleep. Because if you can just stay asleep to yourself, to all of those desires inside of you, those, those wishes, those dreams, it just seems like it's gonna make it better for everyone. And so, uh, you know, finally, um, you have no idea what you really want which seems like a convenient sacrifice to make in order to keep the peace. And yet God has called you to something specifically and so there's this tension in your spirit that will never go away. Now, now here's the thing, we all do this from time to time. Again, we all find ourselves in this peacemaker kind of role where we're doing this stuff, where we're experiencing some of this. But there are some of us in here today, there's some of you watching right now who you experience this on a whole other level. Because you believe that you have to keep your environment peaceful and you have to keep your relationships conflict free in order to have a shot at having peace inside of yourself. But it doesn't actually work this way. See, at the end of it, um, here's the truth, that a life lived where you are trying to pursue peace at all costs will eventually put you in deep inner conflict. And I know, again, this sounds like a, a godly way to live, and it, and it can be, but not the way that you're probably doing it. A peace at all cost, appro uh, cost approach to life will eventually put you in deep inner conflict. Remember back to the question, if you successfully avoided the conflict, have you kept the peace? And the answer is no. Because peace is a very, very tricky thing. Um, peace, you could define it like this. Uh, you could say peace is an internal state of being without inner turmoil or anxiety, right? That's kind of how we think about peace. Like, if I don't feel bad inside, then I'm at peace. Or Miriam Webster throws out some of these definitions. It says, a state of tranquility or quiet, 
you know, internally, externally, very environmental. Freedom from disquieting or oppressive thoughts or emotions, again, getting rid of the, the bad stuff inside. Or later on, I think this gets closer, harmony in personal relations. So not just inside of me, but, but there's something going on in my relationships. But I think if we really wanna see peace, we gotta look at Jesus right after his resurrection. I wanna show you quickly John chapter 20. This is right after Jesus rises from the dead and he's appearing to the first time to his disciples who are all gathered together. It says, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were, were all together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, so they're terrified, they're locked in an upper room, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. So, so it looks like Jesus comes back. These disciples are afraid. He stands there. He says, peace. They're not afraid anymore. They have joy. And this confirms for a lot of us what peace looks like. It's, it's the absence of fear or turmoil inside of us. And that's only a part of what peace means. Because Jesus comes at this a second time. Look, look what happens next. Again, Jesus said... Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So there's purpose there. But, but here, look at this. It says, and with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. See, the Hebrew concept of peace is this word shalom. And shalom doesn't just mean an absence of turmoil or getting rid of the fear or the conflict. But shalom is, is really the presence of something. It's, it's a fullness. It's a wholeness. It's, it's Jesus standing in the middle of the room when you've watched him be crucified, when you've watched him be mistreated, and, and all of your hopes are dashed, and then you watch Jesus standing in the middle of the room, and he holds out his hands to you, and he says, here I am. And again, you have reconciliation and relationship with not just him, but with God. That, that's shalom, that's peace. It's Jesus coming up to you and breathing on you. I mean, how weird and intimate is that? I don't know about you, but I don't let normal people breathe on me. Like, we gotta be, we gotta be related for that to happen and closely related, and even then, it's like, yeah, make sure your teeth are, you know, right? So, I mean, breathing on you, that's not something that we normally let people do, but Jesus, wholeness is this, it's Jesus breathing on his disciples and saying, receive the Holy Spirit. It, it's being indwelt with the very presence of God. See, that's what the Bible's talking about when it calls us to peace. It's not just an absence of conflict or tension. It's not just getting rid of the fear or the discord. It, it is being full. It is being at rest. It is being whole. So how do you get there? I mean, aside from Jesus coming and standing in the middle of the room, how, how do you get there? Well, I think Paul teaches on this. Uh, Paul's another New Testament writer. He wrote a letter to a church in Philippi. Um, so this is the book of Philippians chapter four. And at the end of this chapter, this letter, he addresses some conflict that's going on in that church. And, and through this, you're gonna see not only some keys to resolving conflict quickly, but you're gonna see that, that peace is truly deeper than just the resolution of conflict. Let's look at it together. Paul says, I plead with you, Odia, and I plead with Syntyche, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, so he's, he's talking to the person he's kind of writing to, the leader in the church. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my coworkers, who names, whose names are in the book of life. So, so Paul says, all right, so I, I've given you a lot of instruction, but there's a conflict here. You Odia and Syntyche, you're not getting along, and that grieves me. And so Paul talks about the fact that we should not be content to live in conflict for a long period of time. The peacemakers have it right. Conflict is not a godly thing in an enduring, ongoing kind of way. And so Paul says, I plead with you to be of the same mind, to get united, to, to agree with each other. And, and he asks, asks some of his friends there in the church to help them out and, and to, to help get them on the same page because unity and, and not living in conflict, it matters, Paul says. But then he goes on and he says other stuff that I think we need to hear today. He says, now rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. And, and those who walk the path of harmony, gentleness is not usually a problem for us. 
It's maybe a problem for other people. It's not a problem for you. But, but get this, gentleness with joy, gentleness that's marked by joy and not resentment, that's a different kind of peace. Not just going along to prevent a fight. That's, that's referring to something deeper. So again, how do you get there? Paul goes on and he says, do not be anxious about anything, right? And, and this is, if we walk this path, this is what we fear. We, we don't want to feel the bad stuff. We don't want to be anxious. We don't want to feel the tension or the conflict. Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. See, somewhere along the way in Christianity, we've picked up this idea that part of our work as Christians is to, as uh, people who walk this path do so well, to put ourselves asleep to ourselves, to deny ourselves. It's, it's to eventually just kind of eradicate the self, to deny ourselves. And I'm not really sure how that became a, a Christian idea. It sounds way more Eastern or Buddhist to me. I'm not an expert in Eastern religions, but I can tell you this, it is not Christian because here's what Christian teaching says. Christian teaching says that, that God created you specifically with a unique blueprint for your life of how you would look and how you would act and, and, and what you would be called to do, that he created you with, with deliberation and purpose that is only yours. And so do we think for a minute that God wants us to spend the rest of our lives erasing all of that? No way. Not only that, but, but we learn in Christian teaching that God calls that, that specific individual us, you. He calls you into a relationship with himself. And God wants a relationship with you, the real you. Not some, you know, just kind of bland image of, of anybody with, with you, mess in all, conflict in all, contradictions in all. God has created you for a purpose. And he wants you to discover that purpose. And through a relationship with him, he, he'll shed light on that purpose. He'll help you find your way to it, to your unique path in life. God, God created you for that. Jesus came into the world and he gave his life for you because you matter. And so I don't know where we got this idea that we should just kind of deny ourselves or erase ourselves. I know there's scripture passages that talk about that. And to be sure, there are things inside of all of us that are unhealthy. They're sinful. They need to be put to death because they're getting in the way of life and wholeness and relationship that God has in mind for us. That's all true. But somewhere along the way, and, and those of you who walk this path of harmony, you've gotten so comfortable with this idea. You think it's a Christian idea that if you just forget yourself, if you deny yourself all day long, all the time, if you ignore your purpose, ignore your calling just to get along with everyone else, that you're doing a godly thing. But Paul says no. Paul says if you're anxious, if you're in conflict, here's what you need to do. In every situation, bring those things by prayer and petition with thanksgiving to God. Present those needs and wants before God. And then Paul says, here's what happens when we do that. He says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. See, it's not when we fall asleep to ourselves that we find peace, but it's when we present our full selves to God and we lay it at his feet, the messiness, the beauty, the confusion, the turmoil, when we lay it at his feet, then Paul says, we get what we're after, then we find not just an absence of conflict, not just an eradication of turmoil, but then we find real peace. See, finding real peace is a process of bringing our whole selves to God and watching as he embraces us, our whole selves. It's a process by faith that, that is unfolded when we bring our whole selves to God and we see he cares about every bit of it. That nothing is too trite or small, nothing is, is uh, you know, too insignificant for him. He, he doesn't chastise us for being needy. He doesn't chastise us for being confused. It's, it's bringing our whole selves to God and watching him receive all of us. And when we experience that, and again, you, you can only know this through Jesus. He's your assurance. He's your assurance 
that God wants reconciliation with you because when God sent Jesus, his, his envoy, his emissary into the world, he didn't come with, with weapons to put us all to death for being infidels. No, he came with outstretched arms to embrace us, to invite us into relationship with God. And so you see this through the person of Jesus, what he was willing to do for you. But, but when you experience this personally, when you bring your whole self to God, all of those requests, all of those needs, and when, and when you experience him embrace you, and not turn you away, and you realize it's not gonna cost you the relationship, then you start to tap into the thing that Jesus stood before his disciples and offered right after his resurrection. You, you begin to discover real peace, that shalom promise. And, and then when you get a taste of that shalom and, and you realize that bringing you to the table doesn't, doesn't make the world go crazy, it doesn't cost you your relationships, then you gradually start to wake up to yourselves and discover what's really there the purposes, the longings, the desires, both good and bad. And, and then you bring those things back to the table and through a relationship with God and people, those things get refined and that's how we grow. It's, it's not by denying ourselves from being seen, but it's by bringing our whole selves to the table that uh, then we begin to come alive to ourselves and we begin to sharpen our purpose. Now, here's the problem with that. There are probably people, if you've walked this path for a long time, there are probably people in your life who've gotten very used to you always being willing to eat at Olive Garden. Or they've gotten very used to the idea that you're gonna stay home with the kids while they work. Or you're gonna say no to your dreams or you don't even have dreams so that they can pursue their dreams. And, and for you to begin to wake up to what it is that God is calling you to do, the gifts that he's put inside of you, the purposes that he's locked away in your heart, for you to begin to wake up to that, it may cause some tension. If you've always been the person who just goes along, to suddenly have an idea, to suddenly have a direction, that's gonna create some healthy tension. And I know that's terrifying for you, that's frightening for you, but it is the only way. So you can read through the Bible and everyone who begins following Jesus, when he calls them and says, follow me, and they start following Jesus, and that's what we're here to do. We're here to learn to follow Jesus. Everyone who has that experience, their life initially gets more complicated. It gets harder. It gets more tense for a little while before the shalom comes. But the tension is absolutely necessary, and you don't have to be a forceful tyrant about it. You can be gentle. You can be humble. But the only way to peace is not by falling asleep to ourselves, but it's bringing our whole selves first to God and then to others and letting the power of relationship refine us and direct us so that we eventually come alive to be the full people that God has called us to be. See, if peace is what you really long for, I just want you to hear these words again. Just, just kind of take them in, in your heart. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, that's the kind of peace that you've created us for. Uh, that's the kind of peace we long for deep down, even if we don't realize it. So God, today, um, I pray especially for those of us who might have fallen asleep to ourselves, who have just tried to erase ourselves to be agreeable and to get along. God, I pray that you would breathe on us right now. Pour out on us your Holy Spirit and call to life inside of us what you created us to be, your created intention for us. 
begin to call awake our purpose. And I know that's not gonna happen right away, but even right now as I pray, God, begin to stir something in us as it relates to a deeper sense of purpose. God, banish from our hearts the fear that in pursuing what you've called us to do, it's gonna be bad and people are gonna leave us and just give us the assurance that you will never leave, that you are our good shepherd who sees us through all things so that we do not cower in fear. And God, above all, help us come fully awake, not just to ourselves, but to you, to the relationship that you're calling us into. Yes, us, the fullness of who we are, so that God, we might experience your shalom, your peace. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.